Welcome back. Let's keep going. I think I know what the message means, Kate said in a suddenly uncomfortable tone. It says some people aren't who they seem, that we can't trust the people we thought we could. In other words, Constance is right. We've been tricked. Whoever sent us the message must have been duped as well. It's Rhonda or number two trying to warn us. And it's a little late to warn us, isn't it? Renee pointed out. And what's this about a Gemini? Kate looked very uncomfortable indeed. She must think one of us took part in the deception. Someone had a secret pact with Mr. Benedict to help get the others on the island. You're saying one of us is the Gemini, said Sticky, appalled. I'm sorry, said Kate. It's the only thing I can think of. At this suggestion, everyone grew quiet, looking at one another with unpleasant feelings of suspicion. Well, there's no point in putting it off, Kate said. If I'm right, we can figure this out pretty quickly. Let's tell each other our birthdays. Everybody but Constance gave their birth dates at once. Not a Gemini among them, but Constance refused. This is nonsense. Even if I were a Gemini, which I am not, we don't know for sure that's what the message means. Well, if you're not a Gemini, said Sticky, why don't you just prove it? You prove it yourself, Constance snapped. How do we know you didn't lie? Can you prove when you were born, Mr. Capricorn? Uh, Sticky began, for of course he could not. Constance turned to Kate. What about you, Miss Taurus? Can you prove that you're for us? Kate hesitated, trying to think of an indigent, indigent response that rhymed. Unfortunately, nothing seemed to rhyme with Constance. Can anybody here prove it, Constance challenged. She's right, Renee said with a feeling of great relief. There's no way to prove it. Even in the dim moonlight, he noted Constance's look of gratitude. She'd been very worried about being considered a traitor. That's actually good news, Renee went on, because I'm convinced Mr. Benedict would send a message that made us turn against one another. I'm convinced Mr. Benedict wouldn't send a message that made us turn against one another. Not if there wasn't some way of proving the truth. The message must mean something else. You keep forgetting, Sticky said. Mr. Benedict is here. He's on the island. He's not sending us any messages. He can't be both places at once. That's it, Renee cried. The others shushed him. That's it, he repeated, this time in an excited whisper. Both places at once. Sticky, what's the sign for a Gemini? Sign of the twin, Sticky said offhandedly. His eyes widened. Wait a minute. That's right, said Renee. I think Mr. Benedict has a long lost brother. As is always the case with the society, some arguing remained to be done. Kate wanted to know why Mr. Benedict hadn't told them he had a twin on the island, to which Renee replied that he probably hadn't known himself. But if he hadn't known it, then Kate persisted. How did he know it now? The looking glass, Renee said with a grin. Remember, when you're looking into my looking glass, I spied a trusted face. Mr. Benedict wasn't referring to his mirror. He meant his telescope. They just set them up today, remember? So he saw Mr. Curtin for the first time today, said Sticky, when looking through the telescope. I'll bet it was quite a shock, Renee said. But how could Mr. Benedict not know he had a twin, Kate asked. They were born together. They must have been separated as babies, Renee said. Mr. Benedict told me he was an orphan. When his parents died, he was sent here from Holland to live with his aunt, Mr. Curtin. Must have been sent somewhere else. But they're both geniuses, and they've been... Interested in the same things, Kate said, her imagination catching on. And so, at last, they've been drawn together. Wow, said Sticky. Uh-huh, I'm sleepy, said Constance, who chose not to be impressed. Renee ignored her. It's strange news, but good news. At least now we know we haven't been tricked, Sticky. Better send them a message that says we understand. Sticky did so, 
and at once the lights in the wood began flashing a response. Sticky watched closely, relating the words as they came. Good job. Good night. Good. They stopped signaling. Sticky whispered, frowning. In a moment, he saw the reason. Executives. A pair of them had gone out onto the plaza. They're just standing around talking. Now they're sitting on a bench. Looks like they're going to stay a while. The message was almost finished anyway, Kate said with a terrific yawn. And frankly, I'm toasted. Can't we call it a night? Renee and Sticky agreed, but Constance was incredulous. How can we call it a night? We don't even know what they were going to say. What were they going to say? They were going to say good luck. Okay. Kate laughed. Good grief, Constance. Are you joking? Constance was indigent. Are you? It couldn't possibly have been good grief. The second word started with L-U. Startled, Kate opened her mouth to reply, but Renee cut her off. It's a good point, Constance. In fact, I'm pretty sure they were going to say good luck, don't you think? Constance seemed skeptical about this. After all, she said, they couldn't be sure that that's what the word was going to be, but she was sleepier than any of them. She'd been rubbing her eyes for about an hour. She consented to adjourn the meeting. Meeting adjourned, the others said. Lessons learned. The Learning Institute for the Very Enlightened was unlike other schools. For one thing, the cafeteria food smelled good and tasted even better. Beyond that, there were no textbooks, no field trips, no report cards, no roll call if you were missing. An executive came to find you. No rickety film projectors, no lockers, no team sports, no library, and weirdly enough, no mirrors to be found anywhere. Nor was there any separation between from beginning and advanced students. Class groups were assigned at random, regardless of age or accomplishment, and everyone in that group sat in the same classrooms together, learning the same lessons. The lessons had been designed by Mr. Curtin himself, and when all of them had been gotten through, they were repeated from the beginning. Thus, all the lessons were eventually reviewed many times, and the students who learned them best became the messengers. None of this was familiar to the members of the Mysterious Benedict Society, and yet, in certain ways, the Institute did remind them of other schools, wrote memorization of lessons, was discouraged but required, class participation was encouraged but rarely permitted, and although quizzes were given every day in every class, there was always at least one student who groaned, another who acted surprised, and another who begged the teacher in vain not to give it. Time's up, SQ Pedalion called out during the mon monitoring one day. Pass me your quizzes, everyone, and no dallying, please. A stitch in time saves you time, you know. What? Nine, corrected a messenger in the middle row. Renee recognized her from his other classes, a tall athletic teenager with piercing eyes and raven black hair. She was much older and bolder than most of the other students and had a reputation as a leader among the messengers. Her name was Martina Crow. Nine stitches, SQ said. No, Martina, I'm certain it's just one stitch. No, a stitch in time saves nine, Martina scoffed. Exactly, SQ replied. With all the quizzes collected, the room fell silent as SQ went through the pages marking grades in his book. It was an hourly ritual. In every class, an executive first presented the day's material, then the material was reviewed, and sometimes the review was reviewed, and then the students were giving a quiz over the previous day's lesson. If the material wasn't if the material weren't so strange, no doubt it would have been easily mastered. Today, the Mysterious Benedict Society's third full day of classes, SQ's lesson had been called Personal Hygiene, Unavoidable Dangers, and What Must Be Done to Avoid Them. Like all lessons at the Institute, this one was a barrage of details, pages and pages worth, but the gist was that sickness, like a hungry predator, lurked in every nook and cranny, Every touchable surface was a disease waiting to happen.
Every speck of dust and allergen posed to swell your nose and clog your ducts. Every toothbrush bristle, a bacterial playground. On and on it went, and all of it was greatly exaggerated, Renee thought, even though not entirely untrue. What made the lesson so confusing was the logical conclusion. SQ said, SQ said must be drawn. Okay, the logical conclusion that SQ said must be drawn. Because it was impossible in the end to protect yourself from anything, no matter how hard you tried, it was important to try as hard as you could to protect yourself from everything. There was some kind of truth hidden in there, Renee thought, but it was camouflaged with nonsense. No wonder it gave students trouble. Luckily, he and Sticky had been making perfect scores. To confirm this, Renee glanced over at his friend who gave a small nod and a thumbs up. Probably wasn't even difficult for him. Sticky remembered everything he laid eyes on. So far, so good. Renee twisted in his seat to look at Kate. She puffed her cheeks, crossed her eyes, and put her head in her hands as if she thought she might pop. Not good, Renee decided. Renee decided not to look at Constance. His optimism had been spoiled enough. The other students sat modestly, or mostly in stupors, worn out from the class or else were scouring their notes in hopes of discovering they'd done better than they thought. The messengers, though, were, in, were four in a class, wearing their snappy white tunics and blue sashes, were indulging in a particular habit Renee had noticed. Every few moments, one of them would glance at the door, eyes focused with a keen expectation. Martina Crow was especially fixated. They were waiting up for us to be called out by an executive, called away for their secret privileges. And whenever an executive did appear in the hallway, as Jackson did now, every messenger in the room stiffened with anticipation. SQ, Jackson announced, I need Corliss, Danton, and Selvi Biggs. The messengers in question leapt from their desks, hastily gathering their things. With beaming faces and nary a backward glance, they followed Jackson out. Martina Crow stared hungrily after them. All right, we'll stop right there. Peace out.